This is Richard C. Wilson of the Family Office Club. Today we're doing an investor mandate interview with Mark. Welcome, Mark. Hi. Uh, what type of investor or investment firm would you say that you are? Uh, I would say that we're a family office um, that allocates capital and various proprietary products that we have for family members that we're now opening up uh, externally to outside investors. Great. And then um, just before the call, we were talking about some kind of unusual strategies that were like exotic, non-market directional, alternative investment strategies. And I think right now, investors kind of are more interested in that than they were before, even though before was the time to be more interested in them. They've been reminded of how important those are. So can you go into what a couple of those would be to make it very clear on the types of unique strategies that you're trying to source? Because if I understand your model right, you're sourcing unique managers and setting up managed accounts or allocations and you have your vehicle but you're also allocating into some exotic non-market directional strategies right yes um we've done it all over the many years that i've been on wall street and i've sort of learned what works and what doesn't work and unfortunately mm -hmm. what i have learned the hard way on wall street when you look at the traditional asset classes of stocks bonds currencies and commodities that unless you have a uh, competitive advantage like Renaissance Medallion, you're pretty much not going to stand out. In fact, you may struggle. Mm -hmm. And so our family's mandate and what we try to employ for our clients is we try to make 1% a month net of fees, whether the markets are up, flat, or down, whether they're quiet or volatile, and hopefully never have a monthly drawdown. One of the metrics that we look at is the typical family office metric that we want the net annual returns to be at least five times the maximum monthly drawdown. So if I'm allocating to a manager and um, um, uh, I, I want to control his drawdown, we use, if they don't put up first loss and take 50% of the profits, uh, I put a, a stop loss, a monthly stop loss of two and a half percent on them. Five times two and a half percent is the same twelve and a half percent uncompounded that you would want to get making one percent a month net of fees. So that's the, the profile of the risk and return that we want to see from our managers. And with okay. that in mind, we look for areas in the marketplace that are not necessarily involving stocks, bonds, currencies, commodities, but there are liquid strategies. We do SMAs with them. We have monthly liquidity. And um, uh, we're just trying to make 1% a month or so. So we sure. are drawn away. We are drawn away from strategies that have a directional bias towards any sector of the market. It doesn't have to be the four main asset classes I described. Uh, we, we have found ourselves gravitating to what I call exotic special situation strategy. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a couple examples if you want. Sure, yeah. In the private debt sector, like a lot of people, we look at things ranging from, we're not really allocated to them right now, but we do look at them. Direct lending, litigation finance, life settlements, equipment leasing, trade finance, things along those lines. Again, not correlated to the directions of stocks or bonds. Right. Uh, just trying to make consistent positive returns in any market environment. We have found that uh, there are traders out there who have exploited uh, non, um, sort of less liquid markets that I could still somehow get monthly liquidity for my fund that includes arbitraging crypto. Uh, okay. There are people around the world. We have a manager in Singapore that uh, buys a cryptocurrency at some price somewhere in the world and sells that same cryptocurrency somewhere else in the world at a higher price, locking in the spread. He's got all of the, you know, um, uh, anti-hacking things, you know, encrypted wallets and all that kind of stuff to prevent that problem. We, we have a manager that arbitrages electricity on a global basis. Uh, we are looking at a carbon arbitrage manager, a water manager, 
do have at, uh, our largest allocation is to a firm that uh, does weather derivatives arbitrage. Uh, they try to exploit um, European reinsurance companies that are laying off risk in the energy or agricultural mm -hmm. sector, uh, risk that's basically uh, related to how much rain or the average temperature in a three to six period. And this is a firm that exploits the fact that one guy is looking to buy, another firm is looking to sell, and they're the intermediary and we take, you know, we take out the spread. Sure. Uh, we're looking at an artificial intelligence uh, firm right now that does some interesting things um, in the securities markets. We okay. haven't allocated to them yet, but we're examining them. We have a firm in Chicago, interestingly enough, that has a platform for crypto. And what they're offering us, if we invest with them, is roughly one and a quarter percent a month in market making liquidity rebates. No P&L exposure, no nothing. So we right. like that kind of stuff. So those are some huh. of the unusual things that, that we tend to look at. So it sounds like you're you're staying ahead of the herd and going into these niches. I mean, I would guess in weather derivatives, there's only a dozen serious shops or a couple dozen serious shops there. And, you know, maybe some of them aren't well equipped capital wise. Or I mean, in some of these niches, what does the competition look like in terms of depth of anyone of great credibility or intelligence going after those same types of uh, strategies? There, there are plenty of firms out there that do private debt, you know, litigation, finance, sure. uh, Sure. Life settlements, blah blah blah. Yeah, those are big. In, yeah. in in electricity, there are a couple of firms. Uh, in crypto arb, there are a couple of firms. In weather arbitrage, to the best of our knowledge, there is no one. Yeah, and I heard of that one. That's why Goldman Sachs is talking to this firm about partnering up in a consulting basis, because right. according to the people at Goldman in their J. Aaron division for commodities, they don't know of anyone else trading the weather that has the kind of connections in meteorological right. offices around the globe that this particular firm has. Right. And we just did a webinar yesterday on life settlements for our investors because it's non-market directional. It's not related to a lot of things they're usually allocating to. And what's interesting is litigation finance and life settlements are two of the more popular of the strategies you just mentioned. But in my experience, only one or two percent of investors even know what those things are. Or right. how to access them, and when they do access them, it's through a broker who gets some binary access to a one case or one life settlement policy, which right. is close to worthless because it could go binary on you, of course. All right. Um, so I think that that kind of shows um, how how niche some of the other ideas are, which is, I guess, why you call them exotic, right? That's where you get. That's why that's why it's valuable to be able to source them because they're hard to source, right? It's hard at, to find at those. The, at, at the end of the day, Richard, the best way to make money in the long run is to not lose it in the short run. So you can use you know, positive compounding in your favor. Right. So I found from investors, A, they don't care about excuses when you lose money. And B, right. they don't really care how you make it for them as long as their money is safe and secure. You can do whatever strategy as long as you can explain it in layman's terms and they're comfortable with it and they can sleep at night. So sure. we're trying sure. to find competitive advantage, advantages structurally where... Um, you know, certain firms don't have a lot of competition. Sure, sure. Well, I was going to end the interview asking for your number one piece of advice that would save or make someone $100,000. I think maybe you just gave it. I don't know if you have something else you want to add to that uh, to round out the interview or if you just want to stick with that, that piece of advice. Well, I would tell you to buy lottery tickets, but I don't think that would fly so far. Um, <laughs> you know, there is no free lunch and there is no easy way to or what to do with your first $100,000 to invest. If there was, everybody would be doing it. Right. I believe in diversification. And I believe that if you can make money, make you know a reasonable amount of money and compound it, uh, you're doing great. You don't have to be a hero and make 15 to 20%. Uh, but when the market's right. down 15 to 20%, you damn well better be up. Because right. that's what, you know, alternative investment managers are supposed to be doing. Right, right. That's where I can make the biggest difference, obviously, in your, your wealth is just avoiding some of those big drawdowns, which you talked about earlier. Right. So, yeah, great. No, we're definitely um, you know, a believer in alternatives and um, we're on the hunt for a great litigation finance firm. We've got an excellent, you know, life settlement one. 
uh, that we work with with our clients. But um, I think we think similar. And like one, one of my mentors early on, Dan Kennedy, said, if you're not sure what to do, just do the opposite of everybody else. And, uh, you know, so I like finding things that where it's like everybody that doesn't know about it yet. You know, there's still an arbitrage there. There's still inefficiency yeah. to correct, right? Well, that's our job, Rich, to stay ahead of the curve. Yeah. If the last six weeks of this pandemic have, have taught us anything, again, is if you can make money in down, any, anyone can make money in up markets. Right. Whether right. you can make money when the S&P goes down, that separates you from everybody else. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Great. All right. Well, um, what's the best way for someone to get in touch with you? Is it via LinkedIn or email or phone? What do you, what do you prefer? Um, well, um, I think my phone number and my email address are both on my LinkedIn profile, but my phone number is that's my cell, and um, uh, I have a number of email addresses. Yahoo is one of them. I have like five domain names. So okay. uh, anyone can call me. We're accessible here. We believe in, you know, hands on touching with uh, our, with the managers that we allocate to. Right. Um, we usually leave them alone if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. But if they're struggling, we're all over them like a wet rag. Uh, and with our clients, of course, you know, you have to be, you know, in touch with them all the time, especially right. when the markets are struggling. Right, right. Yeah, for sure. Makes sense. Okay, great. Well, thank you for your time here today, and I'm happy to keep in touch. Well, we will. Thank you very much for thinking of us. Yeah, sure. Take care, Mark. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.